who is going to provide us with a look at real Acadian women. And Susan Surrett Draper is an example of a real Acadian woman. Susan grew up in St. Andrew Rousseau in Yarmouth County, where her family has lived for seven generations. You may know her from her most recent employment as an interpreter at Grand Pre National Historic Site. And I'll just interject here for a moment. Many, many years ago, I spent a summer as an interpretive guide at Grand Pre, and it was a turning point in my scholarly life. In 2004, Susan wrote the booklet, Return to Acadie, a self-guided memory walk of the Annapolis Valley as a tool for anyone interested in discovering the valley from an Acadian perspective. I intend to download that and take the trip this summer. Whether people have downloaded it from the website of Les Amis de Grand Pré or have a hard copy, it's still providing useful information to searchers. For the last 10 years, Susan has been the president of Les Amis de Grand Pré. She's presently finishing a second book tentatively called Refuge, which promises to shine a light on a little known Acadian story of survival in a very personal way. In the summer, you can find her in her garden or heading off to paint en plein air. And Susan also maintains a blog, travelswithsusie.wordpress.com, which she claims has suffered from a lack of attention lately, but you can still read her personal stories there. And this evening, she is presenting for us, not just Evangeline, a look at real Acadian women. And the abstract, some Acadian men's names like Joseph Beausoleil, René Leblanc, and Pierre Melançon are familiar to many people. But have you ever asked yourselves about the women in their lives? How did women support, determination, and leadership help to build and preserve Acadian identity? A few rare comments can be found in history books, but the information is sparse and scattered. Please join Susan now for her look at Acadian society from a female lens. Susan, welcome and over to you. Thank you very much, Lois. Well, it's fun and exciting to see, uh, to be here with the, uh, your historical society and uh, to welcome people as they're arriving uh, in our, for our Zoom uh, meeting. So I'll begin. Not many ethnic groups have a woman as their main icon. Usually it's a war hero, a king or a queen, maybe even an eagle or a beaver. Acadians have Evangeline. When the poem Evangeline, A Tale of Acadie, was first published in 1847, Evangeline was depicted as the ideal Acadian woman, a loyal daughter from a good family, living in a paradise, hope faithful to Gabrielle, her fiance, steadfast in a resolve to find him, religious, selfless, hopeful, long suffering. Hmm. All over the world, people were happy to accept Evangeline as the archetypal Acadian woman. The poem was translated into more than a dozen languages. Even Acadians bought into the myth of Evangeline, welcoming this spotlight on their misunderstood and mostly forgotten history. But Evangeline wasn't real. Her name was made up by Longfellow. Most nations myths revolve around a pivotal moment the life before it and the life after it. For Acadians, it's the deportation, officially known as the Grand Great Upheaval. All Acadians were part of the upheaval, 1749 to 1800, even if they weren't deported between 1755 and 1764. 
early Akkadian society is usually depicted as an egalitarian utopia. But like all societies, there was some stratification. Some families had been granted seigneuries, like the Muse d'Entremont, the Latour and Damour. Those families had more status, but not necessarily more wealth. The bourgeois, Landry, Leblanc, Boudreau and Robichaud families were prosperous and respected members of society. Marguerite Muse d'Entremont is part of both those groups. When Pierre Melasso refused to give either his day, his age, or the details about his cattle and land holdings in Annapolis Royal before moving to Grand Pré, his wife Marguerite Muse d'Entremont sent the census takers away saying, don't be so crazy running about the streets for things like that. What she said, and the quote is, sa femme m'a répondu, si j'étais si fou de courir les rues pour des choses de même. Margaret was the daughter of the Baron Philip Muse d'Entremont, so pulling rank on the census taker was probably not uncharacteristic. She also knew that when census takers come around, it will most likely result in more taxes or some other obligation. Intermarriages between Acadians like Marguerite and her husband Pierre, who had arrived with the English administration of Thomas Temple, were not the norm, but they were not uncommon. Acadians had tra trading relationships with New England, friendly relations with the Mi'kmaq, and there was a rotating authority from England to France and back. In fact, a quarter of the marriages during the first part of the 1700s have a partner from elsewhere. Like one of my ancestors' sisters, who married an Irishman called Daniel Long, a decommissioned soldier in Port Royal. Some French officials and military officers found Acadian wives. Mathieu de Goutin was the minister of the Marine, and he married Jeanne Thibodeau, and thereby connecting himself totally to the Acadian community. Then there's the case of the New England trader, William Wilnet, who married 15-year-old Marie-Madeleine Maisonnet, and one of their daughters ultimately married the man who became the commander at the fort of Port Royal at the time of the deportation. Now there's a sticky situation, deporting your in-laws. Okay. Unlike Evangeline, real Acadian women are our great, great, great grandmothers with names like Marie, Anne, Madeleine, Marguerite, Cecile, Catherine, Jeanne, and Francoise. Finding out about real Acadian women before and right after the upheaval took a little research. I started by asking a male researcher, and basically he told me that written history was sexist and no one had really bothered much with women's stories. I took that as a challenge, and I searched for historians who had written anything on the subject. I remembered when I had worked as a guide in Grand Pré, I came across a report called Aspects of the Lives of Women in Ossian Acadie by Brenda Dunn. My list eventually got longer and included Alphonse Deveau and Sally Ross, Serge Patrice Thibodeau, Maurice Basque, Paul Surrett, George Arsenault, Naomi Griffiths, Hilary Doda, Anne Marie Lane Jonah, Father Clarence Dartremo, and on and on. It turns out some people did write about a woman. All history books agree that family was the cornerstone of Acadian life, a complex system of family relationships and close knit communities thrived. Dykeland agri agriculture required cooperation and childbearing and household duties relied upon family support for success. Let's look at an example of intertwined family bonds. Marie Dugas was 16 when she married Charles Melasso in Annapolis. The couple had 14 children. In 1708, four out of five houses in the Melanson settlement belonged to the Melanson family. There was the matriarch, Marie Dugas, who was by now a widow. 
her daughter Madeleine, the widow of Jean Beliveau, with her four kids. By the way, they are the ancestors of Anne Murray. There was a daughter, Anne, uh, who was a, a widow also of uh, Jacques de Saint Etienne de la Tour. And she was there with her five children, plus her second husband, Alexandre Robichaud, and six more kids. And then there was Charles Melanson Jr. and Anne Bork with their six kids. Now, just to make it a little more confusing for all of you, we would want to note that Charles and his brother Amboise had married Bork sisters, and that three of the Melanson sisters had married Bellevaux. Confused? In 1707, when the last French census was done in the major communities of Les Mines, Port Royal, Cobequid, Beaubassin, women comprised about half of the adults. In 1720, there were around 3,000 people in the census, and 24 years later, the population had more than doubled. Eight years later, there were five to 6,000 women and girls in Acadie. Nutritious food, limited diseases, and few wars helped. Women's names were recycled, sometimes to reflect the name of their godmothers. Nobody was called Evangeline. The good news is that in Acadian society, wives kept their maiden names. Genealogists love this. For example, Cecile Landry remained Cecile Landry all her life, but when she married Pierre Theriot, she also became known as Madame Theriot. When she became a widow, she was identified as the widow Terio. But when she married a second time, the register shows her as Cecile Landry. Some excavations have been done to help us understand what everyday life was like for Acadian families. Like the information from the Seigneury of Alexandre Le Bourne de Belle-Ile. Knowing the villages where Acadians lived, the houses, the family groups listed in census, helps us explain how finds like sets of irons used in sewing, straight pins, thimbles, scissors of all sizes for varying tasks can inform us. Imported fabrics, fine thread for handiwork, and a tablecloth with six matching napkins challenge the myth of a simple, insular Acadian life. Acadian women couldn't go to the local boulangerie for their bread like they may have done in France. They had exterior bake ovens on the west side of their houses. The root cellar had held preserves, salted meats, dried fruits and hearty vegetables to last the winter. Acadian insulation for these houses is called boussillage and was stuffed between logs or boards. And I've even seen references to gypsum on interior walls. Ceramics found in archeological digs come from France, Germany, Spain, Holland, England, the Mediterranean and New England. This shows how Acadians were in fact participating in trade relationships, mainly through New England and Louisbourg. And you know what that brings products from all over the world. Even Chinese porcelain has been found on Acadian digs. So when we read young New England doctor, Robert Hale's account, stating that he had only seen two mugs among ye French, and one of them had a chipped rim, we can assume that he visited only the poorer families in the settlement, or that he was in fact spreading fake news. Acadian women use round bottom French cooking pots called marmites directly on the coals or hung them on pot hangers for savory stews. Some women had oil and vinegar cruets, which were all the rage in Europe at the time. Frying pans, spits for roasting meat and pewter plates have also been uncovered by archeologists. Because fabric disintegrates, faster than metals, historians and archeologists cannot be absolutely sure. 
The generic, generic costumes of the day were linen chemise, neck scarf, cap, knit stockings, wooden sabots, leather shoes for special occasions. In 1755, a New England officer, Ajiba Willard, was struck by the fact that the women wore wooden shoes. He's quoted as saying, I saw a great many French women and girls. Their faces look well, but their feet look very strange with wooden shoes, which they all wore. Now, wooden shoes apparently were not that common in New England, but very common in Europe's rural villages. Robert Hale had also been intrigued with the shoes. He described the women's gait as a straddle and attributed that to wooden shoes. Since friendly relations with the Mi'kmaq were common, it's not surprising that moccasins and clothing made of animal skins were worn too. Brooke Watson, another visitor, commented that furs from bear, beaver, fox, otter, and marten, as well as wooden, woolen and linen clothing, gave the Acadians not only comfortable, but in many instances, handsome clothing. In fact, in 1690, several Acadian women in Beaubassin complained that the priest refused to grant them absolution after confession because they wore lace and ribbon. A couple of years later, Acadian trader Abraham Boudreau brought silk lace and blue ribbon to Port Royal from Boston. Beads worn as jewelry, strung together as a choker, were a popular style in the 18th century. In Robert Hale's report, you remember him about the chip mugs, he notes the women's complexion is darker in Acadie than the ladies of New England. He guesses it's because they live in smoke in the summer to protect themselves from mosquitoes and in the winter to protect themselves from the cold. Now he might have noticed that Acadian women's outdoor lifestyle might have caused the darker skin or that they were possibly Métis, but he put it all down to smoke. He goes on to say, the women's clothes are good enough, but they look as if they were pitched on with pitchforks and very often ye stockings are down about their heels. Robert Hale seems a bit harsh. Maybe he was just longing for the corseted silhouettes of New England women, not usually very popular amongst the Acadian women. Let's also keep in mind the mode of dress would have varied with time. In 1632 to 1755 is 123 years. It's a long time in fashion, even in the 17th and 18th century. And we must also take into account that a lady sitting in a manor who would entertain guests like the notary or the commander and would sometimes travel to France or Boston would have a more elaborate wardrobe than a young woman in a farmhouse with a young family for she would weave her own linen and wool into fabrics and knit her family's socks, mittens, and hats. While widow Marie Dugas' daughters were working in the backyard kitchen garden, or maybe helping with the harvest, she could tell her grandchildren stories like grandmothers do today when they babysit. She could tell them about ancestors who had sailed from France, reinforce the teachings of the church, teach them basic math skills, and maybe even the alphabet. At the beginning of the settlement, there was an attempt to educate children by nuns, but afterwards, there was no formal schooling and no nuns. There were, however, people in each settlement who could read and write. We know Acadians were accustomed to using written documents, so some kind of education was available if not a formal one. Most women became wives and mothers. Most widows remarried. No marriages were celebrated in Lent or Advent. Few marriages happened during spring planting or fall harvest. Acadian women married at an earlier age than in France, childbearing up to the age of 40. 
this sometimes produced large families, assuming that the husband also lived as long as his wife. If married before 20, a woman could average, uh, could have an average of 10.5 children, although the average family size was six children. In the, 16, six, in the 1600s, girls usually married as teens, but in the 1700s, the average age of the bride was 21. Child mortality rates were low in comparison to France and New England. Between 1671 and 1730, three quarters of the children born in Port Royal reached adulthood. In France, only a quarter did. Even though Acadie was a relatively peaceful place, let's not forget it was attacked four times and that it changed hands six times. Some husbands died in attacks, like Jean Beliveau, Madeleine Melanson's husband. Homes were periodically destroyed, houses, barns, and crops burnt, livestock killed, and dikes broken. If hostages and prisoners were taken, women and children were prime targets. At least widows could become legal heads of households. The law permitted them to own land and livestock. Some are identified as shop or innkeepers, and it's not uncommon to find their names in financial transactions. For example, after her husband's death in 1693, Marie de Saint-Étienne de Latour granted land from their seigneury, collected rents, and continued to appear first on the list of census records. In 1752, Marie Alain, the widow of Nicolas Gautier, became the first Acadian businesswoman in PEI. After the deportation years, Cecile Boudreau, the widow of Simon Foret II, was a businesswoman in Arishat who ran a tavern after he died. Before the great upheaval, some women participated in commerce and diplomacy. Anne Le Bourne de Belle Isle came to Louisbourg as the wife of Jean Baptiste Rodrigue, a prominent Portuguese born merchant. She had a shop with great stuff by all accounts. Imports of all kinds from all over the world graced her shelves. That's another reason to think that maybe Robert Hale was passing along fake news. Jean Mews d'Artemont was married to the acting Commandant de Ile Royale by 1744. She served the administration as an interpreter for the Mi'kmaq, the English, and the French. This was a prestigious and trusted position. All groups had to have complete confidence in her abilities. Of course, this work helped to consolidate her social position. Marie Madeleine Bouot was born in Acadie and married a French soldier. He was killed at the Battle of Beausejour. She had a daughter and unusually called her the same name as her own, Marie Madeleine. The mother and daughter eventually reached France and successfully became the first lady in waiting to Louis XVI. And the daughter, Marie Madeleine, accompanied Louis and Marie Antoinette to Varennes on their failed attempt to flee. She escaped blame and died in Versailles at the age of 79. Sunday mass was not just a religious obligation, but also a time for socializing as it brought people together from all over the scattered parish. Here you could catch up on family news, get updates on community gossip. British and French government officials read orders or posted them on the church doors. A revolving door of priests who never seemed to stay very long and sometimes provided a more relaxed attitude, a broader interpretation to religion than in bigger cities like Boston or Quebec. Natural children were absorbed into families. Single motherhood was rare. More information on this will likely continue to come forward now that people are doing their DNA. 
like the recent revelations on the Robichaud family of New Brunswick, who may actually be Richard. A good reputation was very important in Acadie. When the daughter of Boba Saint Seigneur was found to be pregnant with Louis Morin's child, his whole family was banished. The outlandish rumors of Cecile Landry's affair with her brother-in-law by an overzealous priest can still be found in history books. It took a complaint from the Minister of the Marine to the Bishop of Quebec to settle the issue. Ultimately, Cecile and her husband Pierre Terrio, the founding couple at Riviero Canard, were described as people beyond reproach, devoted to the king and the colony, their home a refuge for widows and orphans. From the 1660s, the custom of Paris provided a legal framework for Acadian societies. It covered all aspects of life, such as property ownership and inheritance. Acadian women had the right to hold property. Husbands and wives shared the ownership of property. Sons and daughters shared equally in the inheritance from their parents. Famously, Agathe de Latour claimed to have obtained the rights of all the Latour heirs, which she sold to the British government in 1733. This proves that Acadians could legally own land. Remember that one of the reasons for justification of the deportation was that Acadians weren't legal owners of their lands anyway, and so they could re be removed without compensation. Then, of course, Agathe married two British soldiers in succession, or officers, I should say. You might say she was a little ambitious. Here's a Savoy example. When Jean Savoie's husband, Etienne Pellerin, was forced to agree to sell the Ile aux Cochons, that's Hog Island, to the Commandant Bruyant, well, you couldn't really blame the Bruyant to have his eye on it. It was on a high point, surrounded by salt marsh, with panoramic views up and down the Dauphin River. Jean refused to sign the contract of sale. Bruyant sent his soldiers to coerce her produced a phony bill for improvements, and threatened to seize furniture, goods, and livestock. After several months, she capitulated, but he was reprimanded for using such violence. This in illustrates that no one, even the colony's highest official, could acquire this property without Jean Savoie's agreement as the co-owner. Think of the atrocities of war that regularly flash before your eyes on news reports. It's remarkable how things don't change for women. Famine, disease, death, rape, dislocation from traditional support systems, marriage, miscarriages, stillbirths, widowhood, children dying or being taken away for their own good. I found reports for all these things in Acadian history. Anne Le Prince was born in Pisiquid, where she and her husband, Sylvain Leblanc, were deported and sent to Liverpool, where he died. She made her way to Morlaix, France, from there, like many others did. That was where she gave refuge to a priest who was on the run. On July 1st, 1754, the priest, Anne Le Prince, who was by then 80, and her daughter Anastasi, 38, ascended the scaffold on the square of the town of Brest and were guillotined. But it would be a mistake to assume Acadian women were just passive victims. Nanette Melasso was, was held prisoner at Fort Edward with her family in 1764. Tired of the whole Acadian affair and worried about costs, the English authorities wanted them gone and decided to cut the Acadians' military rations. Winter was coming. The Acadians petitioned for more provisions to last the winter, but the government officials wouldn't budge. So Nanette and a delegation of women went to plead their case to Isaac Deschamps. He tells them the men should be shot for their ingratitude. We don't know exactly what Nanette and her group of women tell him, but eventually he gave the order to continue military rations 
for the 90 families in Pisiquid. Legend says that when Nanette reached her home, which was probably a shack or a tent, she's so happy that she dances. Her family eventually settled in Memramcook, New Brunswick. Marguerite d'Entremont and Marguerite Landry were deported to Cherbourg, France. They had almost succeeded in evading deportation from Cap Sab, first from the Preble Raid in 1756, then the Roger Morris Raid in 1758. But when their group sent a letter to the governor of Massachusetts, Governor Pownall, which of course they probably knew in some ways or another because the people of Cap Sab had really close relationships with Boston before the deportation. You know what he did? He just sent that information right on over to Governor Lawrence, who had them captured and imprisoned and sent on George's Island in Halifax Harbor and deported them to Cherbourg, where they landed in the dead of winter, January 14, 1760. We have letters from Cherbourg to their family in exile in Massachusetts and back home in Pubnico. There are very few letters in existence written by Acadians, much less women, during these times. Four years after they arrived in Cherbourg, 74-year-old Marguerite d'Entremont wrote to her nephew in Boston. She told him her children were sick and that she had sent protests to the royal French court for recognition of their nobility. She also urged them not to take the offer for settlement in French Guiana, saying the tropical climate will kill you. She asked for family news and told them to hang on till more news was known about their fate in France. Nine years later, she writes that she's depressed at the idea of never seeing her family again and wonders who is alive or dead. She sends fond regards to her Mi'kmaq acquaintances in the Pubnico area. Letters from 43-year-old Margaret Amiro in 1773 are a bit more juicy. Many of the letters deal with the disloyalty of a certain Basil Boudreau, who was sent from Cherbourg to Cap Sarb to retrieve money and pelts hidden on an island in Tusket Bay and take it back to support the family in France. But he absconded with a thousand and four piastres, that would be dollars, all the other money hidden in the roots of a tree and the silverware stashed away was gone too. Basil Boudreau simply disappeared. Only rotten pelts, rusted wheel iron, and a pair of old fire tongs were found by Margaret's brother-in-law when he went to investigate. I just love this fo these photos. And because it just seems to illustrate Acadian women just don't sit around. I found them while I was doing my research and both of them show women who are walking and knitting. And the little story on the uh, illustration in the left is Madame Victor, who was a lady walking by the community of Tusket with a basket of blueberries to sell at the market in Yarmouth. And while she's walking, she's knitting. The other one is a lady in Chesacook, which has the same, who has the same idea. Madeleine Leblanc was 19 in 1772 when she uttered the famous words, Nous avons assez broyé, faisons-nous un abri pour la nuit. We have done enough crying. Let's make a shelter for the night. The courage of this feisty, petite young woman made everyone in the family expedition of Pierre Leblanc and Francois Doucet dry their tears. Her words spurred them on. Their despair at seeing the dense forest in front of them and the trials they had been through to get to this point were put aside. They constructed a shelter for the night and they never lost heart again. When she became an old lady in Bay Sainte Marie with the nickname of La Vieille Couèche, Madeleine's words of counsel were, misery never killed anyone. She was living proof. Originally from the village Hébert de Groc in today's New Minas, she had been deported to Salem. 
She eventually married Charles Martin Belliveau in Clare and lived to the age of 98, leaving many descendants. Marie Henriette Lejeune was born to Acadian parents in exile in Rochefort, France. After the fall of Louisbourg, she, uh, yes, after the fall of Louisbourg, when she returned, she settled in Little Brador and then the Marguerite Valley in the early 1800s, where she became the most trusted midwife to end of life caregiver. When she traveled in the woods at night, she carried a pine pitch torch to light her way and a loaded musket for protection. She recruited family members to carry her to her patients when she became blind, using a sled in winter and an adapted wheelbarrow when the snow melted. Historians tell us that this painting is the only representation in existence of a deported Acadian woman. Marie Venerade Pellerin was nine when she was deported from Port Royal to Massachusetts in 1755. She eventually made it to Quebec and after the end or after the end of the Seven Years' War, like many others who took that option. At the age of 25, she married Francois Ranvoisin. The couple had eight children. We can guess that her husband's occupation of goldsmith or that one of her sons was a priest could explain why she sat for a portrait. Between 1895 and 1898, Readers of the newspaper L'Evangeline were intrigued to find out the identity of a regular contributor who wrote about ordinary woman's trials, but did not limit herself to those topics. Politicians, religion, votes for women, buying votes for men, news of the world, economic problems, unemployment, out-migration, and teaching were fodder for her pen. Rumor further around that her name was actually Mademoiselle Emily C. Leblanc from New Brunswick, who had lived in Clare for a time, but nobody knew for sure. She wrote the Acadian language as it was spoken. Great words like Samafa Piche, Stisit, and the good old Acadian swear word, I be desh. Who knows, she may have been the inspiration for our claimed author. Antoine Maillet and Canada's recent poet laureate, Georgette Leblanc. Bro Bridge, Louisiana was established when Fermat Bro, originally from the Martok area, used two live oaks on either banks of the Bayou Teche as stabilizers to construct the first footbridge in the area. His son Agricole built the first vehicular bridge in 1829, Scholastic Bro, Agricole's widow, left with five children and Acadian descendant herself got involved. At the age of 33, she created the plan for the village of Bro Bridge from her family's lands. It included a diagram of streets and a space for a school and a church. This made it possible for Cajuns to buy land and build their houses in the village. Brobridge was officially declared a town in 1829, and Scholastic became a role model for the women of Brobridge. You may have heard of the religious order called Les Petites Sœurs de la Sainte Famille, founded in Memramcook, New Brunswick, by Mère Marie Leonie Paradis. When Fermer Bro of Marta had reached Louisiana, he was alone. All of his family went elsewhere. His baby sister ended up in Quebec, and she is the ancestor of Marie, Mère Marie Léonie. Cléo Mapro was a guitarist and vocalist who recorded one of the first known examples of Cajun music with her husband, Joe Falcon. Alain à Lafayette was released in 1928 and opened the way for other commercial releases of Cajun music. Kathleen Babino Blanco was the governor of Louisiana during the time of the devastating hurricanes Katrina and Rita. 
She was Louisiana's only woman governor at the time. Many Acadian women chose the religious life in the 18 and 1900s. Some became teachers, nurses, or housekeepers, like the Petite Sœur de la Sainte Famille, but not many were daughters of a country doctor in a small village who became famous artists. Born in Bucktouche, New Brunswick, Julia Landry's childhood was spent in Eelbrook, Nova Scotia. At the age of 17, she was off to Mont Saint Vincent to become a sister of charity. After taking her vows at the Mount, she became Sister Agnes. She was assigned to a convent in Boston where her artistic talent was recognized and she was sent to Italy to study with Fidelfo Simi in Florence. Upon her return, she created works of art for primarily the Mother House Chapel in Halifax, but also the Lord Nelson Hotel, the Halifax Infirmary, and many private collections. When she was 72, the Mother House was destroyed by fire, taking with it the 135 paintings by Sister Agnes. She set out to recreate the lost art, mostly depicting the history of the Sisters of Charity in Halifax. She died at 93 in 1973. That is what you're looking at on the screen is one of her paintings and I'm there with her grandniece. In earlier history, Antoinette de Latour, the daughter of an unnamed Mi'kmaq woman, was brought to France by her father, Charles de Latour, where she entered a convent. There her beautiful voice was discovered and encouraged she performed for the queen and many dignitaries, but preferred to return to the Benedictine Abbey where she took her vows. Some people don't like the term derangement, but Acadians themselves use the term in petitions 10 years after the Seven Years' War. I've grown to like it. The English term seems more accurate though, upheaval, like a volcano. Tante Blanche's story is definitely one of derangement. Born in Riviero Canard, which is Canard, close to Grand Pré in the valley, in 1738, her family moved to Chipoudi around 1750. By 1754, they had moved again to the St. John River Valley, and this is where she met and married Joseph Francois Cyr around 1758. But this location became increasingly violent, so the family fled to Kamaraska around 1761. Her first two daughters were born there, but subsequently died of smallpox. Acadians weren't welcome in Quebec at that time, so the young family returned to the St. John River Valley around 1766, where they settled until they were then displaced by the loyalists and told to move. They chose Madawaska and finally settled there in 1790. That's 52 years of upheaval. But here's the story that has made her famous. The fall of 1797 brought a killing frost, resulting in a famine in Madawaska. The words used are the Great Famine or the Black Misery. So you get the picture. Tante Blanche emerged as a guardian angel. She put on her snowshoes, piled clothes and loads of clothes and provisions from her own supplies and from others who could spare them, and brought food and hope to the emaciated and dying. She was credited with saving the community that winter. As time went on, her legend grew. She could heal the sick, find lost objects, reconcile enemies, bestow good luck, save sinners or people afflicted with the drink. People feared her more than the bishop. She died in 1810, leaving a multitude of descendants. Tante Blanche, that would be Aunt Blanche, right? Is considered the mother or aunt of more than half the population in Madawaska. Jean Duga was declared a national historic person 
by Canada on September 30th, 2014. Here is her derangement story. She was born in Louisbourg when it was a busy town fueled by the cod fishery and international trade. She married Pierre Bois in 1752 in nearby Port Toulouse, which is St. Peter's on the Brother Lakes. When the deportation started on peninsular Nova Scotia, the couples helped fellow Acadians make it to PEI, Ile Saint-Jean, or Remscheg, Wallace, but then Fortress Lewisburg fell in 1758, and she and other Acadians filled their schooners with other refugees and fled to the Miramichi. After the fall of Quebec and the final battle of Restigouche, they were taken prisoners and held on George's Island. When they were finally released, the family set up in Arishat, where Pierre became a fisherman again. During the American Revolution, looting revolutionaries attacked the village. Jean's family moved to the Magdalen Islands and then the Gaspé Peninsula. That was where they heard about Charles Robin, Charles Robin, who was recruiting fishermen for his fish exploitation business. In this way, they made it to Chetican, where she lived for another 30 years, practicing her skills as a midwife. She leaves hundreds of descendants in Chetican, whose names are not Bois, but more likely Poirier or Gaudet. She died at 86 and was buried under an apple tree where it's quiet and sheltered from the wind. I'll end with a a little bit of a more modern story. On January 13, 2000, the Supreme Court of Canada came to a unanimous landmark decision that ended the quest of two Prince Edward Island women. Noella Arsenault, an Acadian from Mont Carmel, and Madeleine Costa, a Franco-Ontarian, had led a six-year quest in pursuit of a French language school in Summerside. Using Article 23 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the section of the Constitution of Canada, which guarantees minority language educational rights to French speaking communities outside Quebec and English speaking minorities in Quebec. They won. This victory inspired many other Francophone communities to do the same throughout Canada. Even I was inspired by them when I advocated for French immersion in the Valley in the early 2000s. And we know that there is in Nova Scotia, the Acadian School Board, uh, which must have lots of connections to this. Of course, you probably are thinking that I forgot a few women that you heard of. And so um, I, of course, can't find, I'll tell you about all the women, some of them you recognize here. Modern women today have much more choices than our great grandmothers would have ever imagined. Some of us choose public roles like medicine, the arts, education, literature, business, politics. Others choose more private roles. It's said that a preservation of a heritage and a culture begins early in a child's development. So it's logical that Acadian women, whatever their circumstances, can be credited with saving the culture and can be regarded as more than a footnote in history. Many of us have great role models to show us the way. Thank you.